the moderator for this next panel. Uh, Matt Hussey um, is with uh, uh, Senator Snow. Uh, Matt works on all sorts of telecommunications issues for the Senator. Before he worked for Senator Snow, he was with the American Legislative S Exchange uh, Council, which is a, a state-based uh, organization of state legislators. Um, and in addition, um, his, as far as education goes, is really appropriate. Matthew holds a, an electrical engineering degree from Georgia Tech and an MBA from University of Maryland. So uh, Matt has offered uh, to <laughs> moderate this panel. I don't know when Congressman Lada is going to be here, who has some perspectives on spectrum. So when he does come, you know, I'll, I'll just be waving furiously, and we'll just welcome the congressman and, and get going. Okay, yeah. just to speak. You can. Yeah, I may actually. So oh, great. Can see me yeah, over sure. There as well. Well, thank you very much, and uh, appreciate you all attending uh, this afternoon. And I know that this panel is what stands between you and uh, drinks in the lobby afterwards. So we'll try to make this, uh, you know, entertaining and informative. And I know that there's been a lot of panels uh, over the past several months related to Spectrum, and so it can get a little bit, uh, you know, inundated with all this information with megahertz, gigahertz, you know, harmonic interference and everything else so but we have a, a great panel I mean I know all, these three individuals personally and they're all incredibly knowledgeable on this issue and will hopefully provide a lot of great insight for all of you uh, as we can as Congress continues to debate uh, this topic on spectrum policy reform as well as what we're seeing at the FCC and, and NTIA and uh, you know first up we have Mike Calabrese I think you all are very familiar with him. He's senior research fellow at New America Foundation. Been very involved uh, in broadband issues and spectrum issues. Uh, to his left, Chris Ornelas, who's a friend of mine. Uh, he's executive vice president at the National Association of Broadcasters. And prior to that, he uh, spent several years on the Hill uh, being a senior telecom advisor for Senator Gordon Smith. And then obviously we have, last but not least, John Neuer, president of the, and founder of Newer LLC, and we all know who John uh, is, uh, you know, former head of NTIA, so he has a lot of great insight on federal use of spectrum. And as this, you know, the title of this panel uh, states, it's, it's very clear that there's almost an insatiable need for more spectrum to meet the growing demand of mobile devices, no question about it. And I was glad to see that this said digital devices and not smartphones because that's one thing we do have to recognize is that this is an ecosystem and with an ecosystem it's heterogeneous meaning that there are multiple services uh, that spectrum is is being used for uh, both you know for consumers and citizens that rely on it on a daily basis uh, either directly or indirectly and so we have seen an amazing growth over the past uh, decade with Spectrum. And obviously the big driver has been this, the wireless industry with wireless broadband. Uh, but we, and I guess Cisco, if you know, uh, if you read anything about Cisco's virtual uh, networking index, the data is that they have and the points are just extremely amazing. You know, where smartphones basically use 25 times the amount of, of data that a cell phone does, tablets use three times as amount, uh, three times more mobile data traffic than smartphones and then laptops 22 times more than smartphones so there's a lot of amazing growth and Cisco has, an, has stated forecasted that by 2015 uh, a smartphone you know that mobile data traffic will constitute about 6.3 exabytes per month and I I can't tell you how many gigabytes that an exabyte is but it's an incredible amount and that smartphone that a smartphone alone will per month will consume about 1.3 gigabytes of data so and they expect uh, well over 7 billion mobile devices by 2015 so we're seeing this incredible growth on the device side and we need to figure out ways to improve our policy and our management of spectrum to meet that growing need and even though I talked a lot about consumer and, and John can talk a little bit more about this uh, but also federal users are needing more spectrum uh, there are about 70 uh, federal departments and agencies that use Spectrum for about 40 different types of services. So there's just growing demand, but yet what I call the sandbox, the Spectrum sandbox, is not getting any big, bigger because we can't manufacture uh, Spectrum. So I'll first turn it over to, um, you know, to Michael to say, you know, a few brief open remarks, and then we'll kind of get into some questions, and followed by Chris and then John. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Um, 
thanks, Tim, for including me. I w uh, so I'll start by sounding like I disagree with, with Matthew about uh, the spectrum sand in the sandbox, even though I think we, we, we largely agree. So, there's, so first, there's no question about the skyrocketing demand for mobile data, and that's a good thing. I mean, we want that to continue because ultimately what's going to be good for the economy, competitiveness, people's lifestyles will be pervasive connectivity, ubiquitous uh, mobile high-capacity data that's affordable. Um, but in thinking about the policy response uh, to this sort of hockey stick demand, I think it's, it's, it's very important to make a couple couple distinctions that are becoming the sort of um, conventional wisdom that's wrong. So uh, it's important to make a distinction between increasing spectrum capacity, which is what we need, and auctioning more spectrum uh, for exclusive licensing that fits the mobile carrier's current business model, so the paired spectrum that with nobody else is on the band. That's, that, that is one way to do it, but that's just one of many different strategies to increase uh, mobile data capacity. It's just a, it's going to play a minor role in the longer term picture. Uh, and when you hear uh, a, a, an FCC chairman talking, talk about a looming spectrum crisis, right, it's important to distinguish between, again, between spectrum capacity and licenses, exclusive licenses, because he's, he's actually not talking about a shortage of spectrum in a sense of capacity. What's scarce is government permission to use spectrum. Exclusive licenses below a certain range on the spectrum is, is scarce, but spectrum capacity is, is incredibly abundant. In the beachfront spectrum that's most valuable, you know, right, has a great propagation characteristics where all the, where television is, where cell phone companies want to be. In, 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 all, in all that spectrum, there's less, nowhere, even in the middle of Manhattan, is 20% of it being used. You know, on average, typically it's about, it's like a maximum of about 15% in New York and downtown Washington, uh, uh, around 10, 12% in the suburban areas, and single digits in the, in the small town rural areas. That's based on lots of measurement studies. So most spectrum capacity is unused for a variety of reasons. One is that the big companies are, are warehousing it. So the cable, cable companies, uh, even AT&T and others, have a lot that they're sitting on that they're not building out at all. Uh, what you've heard about is the TV white spaces, which is all the empty, all the vacant channels between TV stations. That's empty spectrum, uh, which we're now putting to use because the commission has been, you know, has. Um, uh, authorize that for unlicensed use for super Wi-Fi, which I'll circle back to in a few minutes at the end. Uh, but then even much more capacity is available on, on bands that are grossly underutilized. And the biggest offender there is the federal government. So, you know, Defense Department has hundreds and hundreds of prime megahertz that they use for, you know, things like AD, radio air navigation, AD, uh, radio air telemetry, et cetera, et cetera. And they say, well, when we need it, we really, really need it. But 99% of the time and 99% of the places, it's not being used. And so it could be uh, with, you know, different policies, different technologies. So these distinctions are critical because of another bit of conventional wisdom that, that's wrong. And that is the notion that we can meet this exploding data demand in the long run by clearing and auctioning more and more beachfront spectrum. In fact, we're, we're very close to the limit now. You can see this clearly in the National Broadband Plan. The centerfold. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. I just wanted to cut in. You had a brilliant thought. I'm sorry to like cut that short. Talking about centerfold. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, okay, go ahead. So yeah. apropos to the spectrum discussion, uh, we've been joined by uh, Congressman Bob Lotta from uh, Ohio. Uh, it's very rare that you get to be able to prepare for an introduction by downloading the congressman's app. But Congressman uh, Lada was the first to have uh, an in the United States Congress to have an app for his office and to communicate with his constituents. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I think you have a new version of the app and waiting approval in the iTunes store. We had a whole discussion this morning about uh, the approval process for uh, iTunes stores and things like that. So that was a whole other discussion. So I, I hope you um, you get the uh, the app approved soon. But um, let me welcome Congressman Lada, uh, who also is the the chair of the Republican New Media Caucus. Welcome.
time. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, and uh, nice. it's nice and cool in here. It's, uh, just walking over from the Capitol building, it's hot today, but uh, appreciate it. And uh, we've all we've been uh, just kind of energy and commerce on, uh, I think we had uh, seven, seven amendments we just went through and passage of, uh, of a bill getting out of committee. But uh, one of the things that uh, I serve on uh, telecom, and it's very, very important, is what you're talking about, a spectrum right now and the, and the need. Yesterday we had a hearing, uh, we had quite a few people in, you might have read in some of the uh, Hill newspapers this morning as to what, uh, especially concerning the D-Block and what we're going to do about public safety. But what my bill is, is uh, H.R. 1622, and it's a, uh, a voluntary uh, relinquishment by broadcasters of some of the spectrum out there that they would be compensated for. And that's one of the big parts of this, is that we want to make sure that they are compensated and it's not an involuntary because there's a, such a need out there right now for spectrum that we that uh, that's what this bill addresses to get to get that out there and you know when you're looking at on the spectrum issue uh, what it can do is really it's about jobs too number one you know when you look at the technology that's out there that we can put more people out back to work out in the united states by uh, making the uh, the product that people are going to have to have you know when you look at what you carry around with you it's very, very important that we can get more people out there working. And on, on the second is that we could be reducing the deficit by the sale of the, uh, the uh, excess spectrum out there at this time. Because what we'd be doing, of course, is that uh, we'd uh, fairly compensate those that would have relinquished spectrum right now. And at the same time, the, whatever that uh, would not go to pay them would go back into the Treasury to reduce uh, the, the, uh, the deficit. So it's a very, very important issue right now. And there's going to be a lot of discussion because as we're working on this piece of legislation, the Energy and Commerce Committee right now is working on what we're going to be doing, especially in telecommunications. And Spectrum will be part of that overall bill. And so uh, in talking with uh, uh, Chairman Upton, you know, we've got the bill out there so we can start uh, getting the issue out to uh, the folks that are very, very interested on the Spectrum side. And with that, if anybody has any questions, I'd be very happy to try to answer them if anybody has a question. Hi, Representative. When are we going to see an Android version of your app? <laughs> That's funny. That's amazing. Well, I tell you what, we're, we're, we're trying to keep up on everything that we can possibly do, uh, especially on the new media caucus. Um, about, it's hard, you know, down here it's hard to, you can't keep track of it. It was a month ago, uh, six months ago, or a couple of years ago, but we were out in uh, Silicon Valley and meeting with all of the, uh, the folks out there, especially the smaller companies, as to uh, you know, the products that they're bringing out and bringing to market. And, uh, you know, it's absolutely amazing what's happening out there. And the other thing that we always have to also deal with is with, uh, uh, with franking and, and making sure that everything that we do, we can get approved. But really, I don't think that the, the House or Congress in general has really kept up where uh, the, uh, the, the new media has gone out there. So as, you know, as we keep going, you know, we're going to keep pushing because, it's, again, we have to get out the information to the American people, uh, the media that they're using. And it's not the old, you know, put it in the mail and wait for it to, to get delivered in seven days. So, you know, we're, we're really pushing to keep this thing going because otherwise, they, again, we're way behind where our constituents are. In terms of um, spectrum and using it as a means of raising revenue, um, how do you see the breakdown going in terms of R&D versus public uh, first responder networks? Or how would you like that to be decided? Well, if you're talking about like on the D block, right. uh, you know, the, the committee hearing that we had yesterday, I think we had, uh, it was either five or six witnesses, a very, very good uh, uh, hearing that we had. Because the question as to what's happened since 9-11 uh, and what they were trying to do at that time, it's, 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 you know, again, I hate to say this in Washington, but it sounds like we just wasted about nine years and about $13 billion that we're not getting back. And so we're almost like we're starting from scratch on this. And so that's where the, where the, uh, the, the subcommittee right now on telecom is going. We're going to have to figure out what we're going to do there, especially on the D block, and, and uh, you know, how much we're gonna, needs to be allocated right now and, uh, and how much uh, of that can be allocated somewhere else or how much we could get for it if we'd sell it. Um, 
one question. How long would you predict that this is going to take for the United States Congress to do, work, do its work? This session, or is it going to go into the next you know, I'd session? I'd hope that it would be this session, because I think that, uh, especially in uh, ENC, that we want to get a bill crafted this, you know, this year. And so as we're working forward, I'd hope to see that we could get it done this session. Yeah. Well, Congressman, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. We're looking Thanks forward to the much. Android version of the app. So <laughs> okay. thank you. Thank you. to our regularly scheduled programming. So, uh, Michael, why don't you yeah, take another minute or so to Sorry, finish Michael. up. Okay, yeah. Just finish up remarks and then we'll turn to Chris. Yeah, wrap it up. So, um, so, so I think essentially where I was heading is to say that incentive auctions, as we just, uh, you know, heard about whether uh, there's relatively few opportunities like that left, you know, spectrum that um, even though it's so largely unused, it's all assigned to somebody, and the and the the ability to uh, to clear uh, users off completely and auction it um, is 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 just going to buy us some time in the short term. But longer term, we have to lay the foundation for for greater spectrum efficiency, for more efficient spectrum use, and there's tremendous potential to do that, as well as for a greater spectrum band sharing, which is particularly there's particularly a lot of potential for that on the federal. Uh, bands. So that is, we need a spectrum policy that is more, it's, it's, it's about more than auction revenue. And I just wanted to give a quote that Reed Hunt, the former FCC chairman, spoke at our event on spectrum a couple weeks ago, and he was pointing out that um, back in the, in the 1990s when uh, they decided to shape, consciously shape a competition policy for what was then just the, the emerging market for mobile telephony to go from a duopoly to a competitive market in, in, in cell phones um, that Ed Markey and others inserted in the uh, Budget Balancing Act, the 93 OBRA, a provision that allowed the FCC to auction spectrum. And, and, and Reed said, quote, one beautiful brushstroke in this fine work of legislative art was the command that the FCC not maximize revenue, but instead optimize for investment and innovation. I certainly hope that those currently in charge of these issues will never neglect this huge, shiny pearl of wisdom. In other words, that, you know, the, the one-time revenue from an auction, uh, it, it's nice, it's incidental, uh, but even under the Communications Act, it, you know, it is the secondary thing. And, and, then we, and we need to keep that in sight now because there's this debate about incentive auction legislation, and everybody's so focused on raising enough money to pay for a public safety network that we're forgetting good spectrum policy. Um, that's not the case, I'll say, with the, the, the legislation, for example, that was uh, introduced on this by, uh, by Matthew's boss, by uh, Senator Snow and Kerry. They have a lot of great spectrum policy that is very forward-looking in terms of uh, sharing, in terms of laying the groundwork for band sharing, uh, a comprehensive spectrum inventory uh, that protects broadcasters but also protects the unlicensed use of the TV bands. Because right now, actually, I guess technically, the largest incumbent uh, soon in the TV bands will not be the, the TV broadcast stations, uh, but super Wi-Fi. Because there's a greater number of, of vacant channels than channels in use, and they've all been allocated, reallocated now uh, to increase the amount of better spectrum for Wi-Fi type technologies and spectrum sharing. And that's really going to be helpful for you know, offloading from these ex more expensive uh, wireless networks, as well as for all kinds of new innovation. Um, and it's been very bipartisan, adopted twice on a 5-0 vote at the FCC, spurred by very bipartisan legislation on the Hill before that. So just to conclude, I'd say that we need to make sure in this incentive auction legislation uh, that we direct the FCC not only to protect uh, over-the-air broadcasting, in terms of its, uh, its continuation, but also to protect nationwide access to the unlicensed spectrum in the band. There may be less of it, but it needs to continue to be in every market. Otherwise, we, don't, we won't have the scale and scope for the sort of investment uh, in innovation and new devices and technologies that's going on there now. 
Chris. Uh, first, let me say thank you to Matthew and to Tim for the invitation. This may be the first time that a broadcaster has uh, come up to sit on a panel and talk about the interwebs. So uh, you'll indulge me if I make some mistakes. Um, let me say at the outset, there's a, there's a lot of rhetoric that flies around in Washington about uh, broadcasters' opposition to uh, spectrum reclamation policies or incentive auction legislation, and it moves forward. And you know, notwithstanding the fact that we have unequivocally stated time and time again, beginning as early as June of 2009 in response to um, uh, Larry Summers' uh, press conference where he talked about the need for more spectrum for broadband, that we have absolutely no opposition to incentive auctions. We fully support incentive auctions to help address the perceived capacity crunch uh, that's coming for the wireless carriers. Our sole and primary concern has always been uh, that we believe we provide a valuable service. And we believe that the viewers in this country uh, rely on over-the-air broadcasting still, are increasingly relying on over-the-air broadcasting as an alternative uh, to uh, uh, paid television, and that the types of, the, the, the folks that who are relying on, are disproportionately relying on our services shouldn't be forgotten. We made uh, certain promises to viewers during the DTV transition, which I'm sure John's painfully rem uh, uh, reminded of. Uh, we, we made certain promises during that transition as broadcasters and, as, uh, and the folks here on the Hill, and that was that we were going to provide more programming, uh, better television, uh, more robust picture, and new services. Uh, two years after the end of that transition, broadcasters are delivering on that promise. We're delivering multicast programming. We have uh, over 431 channels nationwide of multicast programming, where before we didn't have any in 2008. Uh, in L.A. alone, we have 53 some odd stations, half of which are providing foreign language programming. Uh, so we're providing the more programming and, and, uh, that we had promised during the DTV transition. We're also providing more robust uh, high-definition television uh, pictures. We're also um, rolling out mobile DTV uh, in, in several markets across the country with the notion that we'd be up in, in almost all the major markets uh, in, in the foreseeable future. And so as, as the debate continues in Washington as to, you know, why are broadcasters standing in between uh, getting more spectrum to market and, and the promise that is mobile broadband, I think the answer is we're not. All we're simply doing is trying to ensure that as Congress moves forward and as the FCC moves forward in implementing whatever Congress deems fit, that they do so with an acknowledgement that uh, there are repercussions for those uh, viewers out there who continue to rely on over-the-air television. And uh, to the extent that we have uh, broadcasters who want to participate, uh, we say go forward and, and, and participate in the auction. But the majority of our broadcasters want to continue to be television broadcasters. Um, and our obligation is to them and the viewers uh, to ensure that uh, this industry remains viable and a service that they can rely on going forward. I'll close with just a, a quick analogy. And, and, and by the way, I, I, so I think many of the things that Michael has said uh, um, uh, up here today, I think the broadcasters would agree with. Uh, you know, I think we were uh, among some of the first folks to point out that this isn't a spectrum crisis, it's a capacity crunch. And as a capacity crunch, there are probably a number of different ways uh, that, that we could go about solving this problem, our spectrum being but one of them. Uh, and we also uh, um, uh, fully support uh, Senator Snow and Senator Kerry's bill. Um, we think it is the proper policy approach. It takes a holistic view of spectrum uh, policy going forward. Um, but with respect, to, um, with respect to the broadcasters who want to stay and provide this valuable service to millions of Americans across the country, uh, I would simply say this about the voluntary piece. You know, uh, Senator Smith uh, often likes to say that, you know, if you live in a townhouse in Georgetown, Capitol Hill, what have you, and your neighbor decides that he's underwater, he can no longer pay his bills, and he decides to burn down his row house. Uh, to take the insurance money, get out of the business altogether. Uh, he's volunteered to do that. But his neighbor, who wants to continue to live in that home, is necessarily affected. 
by that decision. And so all we're saying going forward is uh, if we have folks that want to get out, that's fine, but let's do this in a careful and considered manner so that we, we don't uh, end up destroying what has been a very valuable enduring service for millions of Americans for decades. You get one bite at this apple. If we do it wrong, these stations are not coming back, and the re repercussions will be felt f for years and years. Okay. John? Thanks, and uh, thanks for having me. And I think that is the one policy position that we can all agree upon, that arson and insurance fraud will be bad. <laughs> Uh, let's step back a little bit, sort of first principles on spectrum policy and communications policy in general. Uh, the driving uh, public policy interest of the FCC, as directed by Congress, is to take steps in furtherance of the public interest. And Historically and traditionally, the public interest, the best proxy for the public interest, is typically viewed as consumer interest. So in a marketplace such as the, the spectrum-dependent marketplace writ broadly, that is marked by such rapidly changing innovation and technology and different technologies for different services, um, mind-boggling innovation, the pace of it sometimes, uh, the only way to really determine the consumer interest is to have that tested in a vibrant competitive marketplace. So different market, you know, there were some comments earlier that I think that we needed to, uh, we would be better off if we had uh, moved the entire country to a single air interface standard for mobile phones uh, between CDMA uh, in favor of GSM. That was a very conscious decision that we made in the outset of the, the, digital, um, the digital mobile communication space for the government not to make a baseline technology decision like that, to let companies choose technologies to serve that they viewed would best serve their customers and let technology be one of the competitive factors in pursuit of this consumer interest. Uh, that's worked very well in the wireless space. I think one of the debates that we have around spectrum now is sort of stepping back from that and saying, well, maybe, maybe some spectrum's not being put to the best use. And the government should decide through implicit or explicit incentives and subsidies and directions and auctions and other criteria to encourage some licensees to either uh, get out of the business and give spectrum back so it can be given to a different licensee. I think that we would find that that is unlikely to produce a very good outcome given how rapidly things change. Uh, and that perhaps while incentive auctions may very well be a good idea if some people, as you know, I think both uh, Chris and Michael have, uh, have said, some people may very well decide that their best business plan is to uh, uh, give Spectrum back and recoup some of the revenue of that. But I think to have the best likelihood of the highest consumer interest, we have to have also not have the government be putting their thumb on the scale to decide what that decision should be. I think the best way to encourage competition is for the government to the maximum extent possible to be out of the business of selecting business models and technologies. I think if all spectrum licensees were basically given the opportunity to invest and innovate in whatever way they saw fit, those that provide the best consumer uh, uh, benefit are going to be the most successful businesses. And by definition, we're going to be serving the, uh, the consumer interest and the public interest uh, more broadly. So rather than trying to think about how you can take spectrum from one licensee and deliver it to another, uh, or deliver it to a different service with a different set of rules, I think while we're thinking about incentive auctions and other ways to create creative uh, ways for uh, transactions to take place to move spectrum from one uh, business model to another. At the same time, we ought to be thinking about eliminating the rules so that different licensees can provide the same kinds of services. We'd have more competition across services. We'd have more opportunity for creative investment and innovation. Uh, I think we'd likewise have more opportunities for uh, success and likewise failures in the marketplace. But I think it's that creative tension, that competitive tension, that's going to most likely give us the best technical solutions for the most capacity for consumers, the most innovative pro-consumer services, 
and that we will get to a, a better place at the end of the day through uh, allowing lots of different services, whether broadcasters want to get into different kinds of businesses, whether the wireless carriers want to get uh, into more competitive space with the broadcasters by delivering mobile video content, uh, and uh, that as we go through this exercise of trying to have auctions which have the, the unavoidable allure of raising money, which uh, I agree with you, Michael, that the uh, A was a good policy position and it's still in the statute, that the amount of money that's raised should not be the driving public policy uh, uh, decision point when the FCC is deciding on whether to auction, whether or not to auction, how to design the auction. Uh, revenue raising is a good thing. Uh, I think there's going to be uh, lots of good can come from a thoughtful incentive auction policy, but at the same time we're doing that, we can also put lots and lots of spectrum to much higher and better use if we un, uh, unrein the restrictions that we have on a variety of different spectrum uses depending on the service providers that are, uh, that are using it. Okay. okay. Well, thank you for the opening remar remarks. And I guess, you know, uh, Michael, you touched on you know, unlight the role of unlicensed white spaces, Chris, you've talked about, uh, you know, ensuring that, you know, broadcasters and the valuable services that they provide are acknowledged. And then, John, you were talking a little bit, you know, it seemed a little bit more about just kind of more flexible use, you know, kind of continuing to migrate from that command and control traditional to just, hey, however you want to use it, go ahead. So let's uh, drill down a little bit, you know, deeper. I mean, certainly there's a, you know, plethora of bills uh, in Congress related to Spectrum, and thank you very much for the kind remarks uh, for the Snow Carry Bill. Uh, I did not, you know, ask for them to say that. But, and then also you have the National Broadband Plan, which kind of provides a blueprint on how they perceive moving forward with Spectrum. But, you know, what, what would you say to, you know, the commissioners or to the members of Congress of being the, you know, top two or three items that you feel are, are critical as we address moving forward? And, I, you know, you've kind of danced around them, but more specifically, you know, what, what would you rec specifically recommend? Uh, Michael? Okay. Um, well, the one, I, the one I think I was trying to get to specifically at the end is to, is to really maintain a balanced ecosystem between licensed and unlicensed spectrum, because we can see right now you know, what's happening is that the, the traditional carrier business model, right, with, um, you know, towers, towers and power isn't going to be able to keep up uh, with demand even if we throw some of the limited more spectrum, you know, TV spectrum or what have you at it, right? And that's because really there's, there's something called Cooper's Law. Marty Cooper, who invented the, uh, the cell phone at, at Motorola, um, talks about, she demonstrates actually how over the past 50 years, 95% of the increase in spectrum capacity has not come from providing more spectrum, not come from auctions. It's come from shrinking the cell size, in other words, from reusing frequencies over and over. And the greatest reuse of that that's actually working out there now in the market is Wi-Fi. That's why what saved AT&T's bacon on the iPhone when everyone was getting, you know, knocked off, there was all that congestion, was AT&T bought... Uh, Wayport, the, you know, the hotspot network, and they expanded it into 24,000 Wi-Fi hotspots. That's why you can use it free at Starbucks and all kinds of places. That's AT&T. And now they've got these meshed Wi-Fi hot zones they're putting in sports stadiums around Times Square and so on. And that's because, you know, you can use Wi-Fi. It's very low power, uh, and it, then it connects to the wired infrastructure. So what you really need is you, you don't want a tower in your backyard right? <laughs> you want to be able to have your bits go where it's most economical to go. But yet, there's some of the bills in, in Congress now, I think, on incentive auctions that it would inadvertently kill super Wi-Fi, you know, that would uh, end this great technological progression with the, with the balanced ecosystem between licensed, uh, unlicensed. The, the second thing mentioned much more quickly is, and this, is, this was in uh, Matthew's bill, the uh, is that we have a spectrum we, we set up a spectrum relocation fund to pay for federal federal agencies to get off certain spectrum back in 2006 there was an auction AWS spectrum advanced wireless services and so it paid you know and, and I think John was probably in charge of some of this it 
it, it paid the federal users to migrate off those frequencies so that they could be auctioned. That was great, but now what we need to do is expand on that fund, turn it into a spectrum innovation fund so that federal agencies also have money available, probably from, from some of the, you know, small part of the auction receipts, to invest in uh, band sharing technologies because so many of them could just make put better filters on their radars or do all sorts of things that would allow them to open their bands up for commercial, uh, for commercial users on a shared basis, protecting federal systems, which often can't be moved, but allowing for much greater spectrum efficiency, uh, once again, making us less dependent on this sort of, uh, you know, uh, forcible auction uh, option. Um, so if the question is, what would broadcasters like to see in spectrum uh, bills going forward, I think it's probably not the right opportunity to talk about sort of the water under the dam, which is, uh, um, you know, can a, more f a fuller exploration going forward of uh, the demand side of the equation, uh, as opposed to, or rather the supply side of the equation, rather than all of this emphasis on demand, demand, demand. The notion being that we have a hockey stick demand curve and it has to be sated with spectrum uh, without fully exploring uh, the other supply inputs, whether it be more robust infrastructure builds, um, whether it be um, more uh, dynamic spectrum uh, sharing policies, uh, or whether it be uh, something as simple as acknowledging that broadcasters can be part of the, the solution in easing the congestion on wireless networks going forward to the extent that uh, Cisco's own data reports, I think it's somewhere in the area of 55, 60 percent of, of all future traffic, maybe more, uh, will be video related. Uh, there is probably not an architecture in, in the world that is better suited to delivering video uh, on a one-to-many basis than that which the broadcasters already have. That is to say, it's terribly inefficient to run video on a one-to-one -one basis to all of the end users when a broadcaster can send it out one time and reach tens of millions of people. But this isn't being explored in sort of the current writings uh, on the Hill. Uh, I think we miss an opportunity in not exploring how broadcasters can be part of that solution in that way from a budgetary standpoint as well. When we started this discussion, I think the uh, CEA, CTIA funded report said there's 38 billion out there. Uh, and incentive auction spectrum. And then I think the White House said, no, there, there's 28 billion. And I think a, a recent report from CBO or the CBO scoring of the bill that, that dealt with our spectrum. So now it's 24 billion. And all of those don't consider sort of the impact that an AT&T T-Mobile merger may have on receipts uh, to the US Treasury uh, from an incentive auction. But one thing is true. Broadcasters have an obligation to pay an annual fee back to the U.S. Treasury on any services that they provide in excess of their primary video stream. The ancillary services that we provide uh, on the on the six megahertz that we have is a continue. We have a continuing obligation to pay on those revenues to the U.S. Treasury. So today we're doing multicast. Tomorrow we'll do mobile DTV. Uh, 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 five years in that from now, you know, broadcasters and they're currently exploring a way to do data casting. Uh, we, you want your Wall Street Journal every morning on your iPad is the one-to-one -one model, the efficient, most efficient way to deliver that to the masses? Probably not, but broadcasters do it and with, adult, uh, with a data casting play that would then uh, provide an ongoing revenue stream to the US Treasury that could grow over time? Absolutely. So if the question is what should bills consider going forward, I think they should consider less how to wrest spectrum from uh, the broadcasters uh, to solve uh, a, a budgetary crisis and a perceived spectrum crisis and consider more maybe how we can be part of the solution that uh, provides an ongoing reven revenue stream to the U.S. Treasury. Uh, I tend to agree with, with most of that. Uh, I think it's very interesting. If you look at the demand side, the demand has been generated by the fact that the mobile carriers have not had any limitations on what they can do with their spectrum allocations, except for a basic non-interference constraint. They've been allowed to innovate and invest in all manner of pro-consumer services, which generates 
uh, all of this demand. It's this, uh, this virtuous cycle. They do more innovation and more investment, provide new services, whether it's apps or video downloads, all those sorts of things, has put more and more demand on their networks. Uh, you know, easy solution to that would say, I've got it figured out. You guys just do voice and text. Don't do anything else. That'll solve your spectrum crisis. Uh, that's the kind of, uh, of thinking or that's kind of unintended consequences that come from when the government says, we're going to figure out what the best business model is and who's going to be the best provider of that business model. So I think Chris is making some very interesting points about uh, the possible future for broadcasting. Broadcasters haven't had that flexibility. Broadcasters seem to be the the last spectrum dependent licensee where the government says this is the technology you must use and this is what you can do with it or uh, you can do whatever you want but it's just this technology so you're bound by the limitations of this particular technology so again I think the the general concept of incentive auctions is a good idea if there are uh, licensees out there who would like to transfer their spectrum to a different use in exchange for simply a strict cash payment that's great, and we should encourage those kinds of transactions. But we ought to be very mindful that when that transition is over, that's what's left behind, is an innovative broadband marketplace and as well a very innovative broadcast marketplace where they are allowed to conduct the same kinds of investment and innovation to deliver new services. You know, on the point of one-to-one, uh, of -one, I was at a minor league baseball game with uh, – uh, you know, last spring, and uh, the game wasn't that interesting, but the Masters was on. So I had the Masters app on my iPhone, and I downloaded the Masters, and I was watching the Masters. I was out in uh, rural Maryland somewhere. I guarantee I was killing that cell tower. I mean, nobody was getting a call out anywhere because I was taking all the capacity off of that one cell tower because I was selfishly watching the Masters because the game wasn't very good. Uh, those are the kinds of places where, you know, point-to-multipoint technology is – uh, does present a, a spectral efficiency. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, I've seen or heard of studies, uh, internal studies, of some of the wireless carriers that they're finding that if I pull my phone out of my pocket and start to watch a video, that is unlikely to be an isolated event, that consumer use patterns aren't, you don't randomly pull your phone out of your pocket and start watching something. You're typically doing it because an event has driven it. Either there's something going on, the Masters is on, so I wanted to watch it, or a, uh, a, they've, they've tracked that it's even uh, uh, you know, YouTubes and viral clips that can get sent around. They go out into people's emails, and suddenly lots and lots of people start looking at it. There are algorithms that they are developing to predict in a geography how many people were likely in a certain period of time to want a single piece of video content. So I think there are all kinds of opportunities to integrate these two industries, but that's going to happen when they have the flexibility to pursue those plans in response to competitive pressures and uh, market dynamics, uh, not when the government decides, you know what, we think somebody else can make better use of your spectrum if we give them more flexible rights to it than you currently have. Matthew, can I just add one data point to to, sure. uh, to what John said? I think it, you know, if the discussion in Washington surrounds how inadequate uh, our current spectrum allocation is for remaining competitive in the wireless mobile broadband race, I think it's relevant to note, as we discuss the one-to-one -one and one-to-many piece, that you know the the global leader in wireless broadband in South Korea, with 95 out of 100 residents using wireless broadband is also the global leader in mobile DTV. And when we talk about mobile DTV, we're not talking about a one-way stream. We're talking about, at least in South Korea, uh, you know, phones that have the capability of caching, uh, caching content that's delivered so that you can watch it when, where and when you want it, and on-demand services. So there's a lot of flexibility that's built in over there, and their wireless, uh, the, their terrestrial broadcasters are able to maximize both their asset, but also the efficient use of the spectrum over there uh, to the benefit of all the consumers. Hmm. That's very interesting. Well, you know, there's certainly been a lot of attention on auctions. Uh, the FCC has held roughly 90 auctions since, I guess, around 1994 when they, Congress provided uh, authority to do that. 
but yet we kind of see a possible looming spectrum crisis and also the most the past two wireless competition reports were kind of silent on determining whether it was an effectively competitive marketplace even though that's required by the statute so i guess my first question is are auctions the i mean the path forward to achieving uh in meeting the demands that we're seeing or so that would be the first question the second question is another issue or mechanism that hasn't been widely discussed but has been a constant um item on you know administration's requests has been spectrum fees i think that has been every year uh the administration since i guess clinton has recommended to be pr provided a spectrum fee authority based on you know fair market value and so i know Broadcasters have been adamantly opposed to that, but as I said, the Bush administration was a strong supporter of that. So what are the merits or disadvantages of spectrum fees? Um, because, and I would just say, because we have seen other regulators like the UK model, uh, Ofcom, UK regulator, you know, implement spectrum fees, and it has seemed to push greater efficiencies with uh, licensees, so. Uh, I really, really probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyhow. I'll give you both the, the, the real world answer to the, the history of that and also some, some policy views on it. You know, the, the, the simple reality is that spectrum fees have been a budget trick for a long time. You can write down, we assume their fees are going to be collected knowing they never will, spend that money as an offset and say, hey, it wasn't our fault. You guys didn't, uh, didn't impose the fees. Uh, so that's why fees have been uh, included in every budget, I think, since the Clinton administration. It's an easy way to conjure up, you know, 20 billion bucks and then spend it. Uh, that being said, fees are a, uh, uh, an interesting economic tool. I think Chris was talking about the Section 336 fees, where the government acknowledged that if broadcasters get into, that broadcasters got their spectrum as a part of a deal where in exchange for the spectrum, they would pre be providing free over-the-air services to consumers uh, to the extent that they have the ability to provide services other than free over-the-air, whether they're subscription-based or they're, you know, uh, uh, they're charging other uh, businesses for fees, they have to then give back uh, a percent of that revenue to the government. Uh, it's currently a 5% of gross revenues which uh, may not sound like a big number, but if you take the one-time auction payments that the government has collected and measure that against the gross revenues of the mobile carriers that provide uh, services on that auction spectrum, it's probably a pretty sizable number. Uh, and fees are also an incentive for, uh, for entities to use their spectrum more efficiently. I think the issue with fees uh, being charged to government uh, entities is not without its appeal as well to the extent that creates an incentive for uh, uh, more efficient use by government users. The challenge I've never been able to figure out on that is that fees on government spectrum are fees that the government is paying to itself. And you know, I think there are some, some inefficiencies on that part. I'm not sure how strong an incentive it really is. So one, if I could add a quick Thing to what John just said is our I'm on this commerce uh, spectrum management advisory committee which was advising John <laughs> once upon a time I guess and you know the current uh, NTIA and um, what we uh, recommended along those lines uh, actually it was it was the most contentious issue could never it was uh, it sort of actually was never a consensus to recommend uh, fees on federal spectrum users per se but we said we sort of hedged and said they should explore um, fees. I mean, the, the good thing being to internalize opportunity costs, make you more conscious of it in the budget process, because right now it's treated more or less as a free resource. Uh, but, but I think what would be the most useful thing about it is beca because of what John mentioned, this problem where it, it, it's sort of just an accounting thing if it's going in, it's going out of one pocket into another of the same government but what you can do though is it is those those spectrum fees even if they're modest could be what goes to fund the spectrum innovation fund that I mentioned in other words once again even if that fund is o only reimburses uh, federal agency users of spectrum it could be a place where they could go 
you know, off off their own budget, uh, because right now they have they have no incentive and every disincentive to share their unused spectrum capacity by doing things like I said, like retrofitting their their radars or um, or, or 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 becoming part of a database management system or whatever it is. But if there was if there were spectrum fees that they had to pay and they could only get that money back if they're actually doing something with it to improve spectrum efficiency and to improve commercial market access to the federal spectrum, that might be a you know a positive way to get uh, to get the right kind of uh, investment as well as to internalize a bit of opportunity cost. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief on this. I will acknowledge that Matthew's statement of broadcasters' position on spectrum free fees is accurate. <laughs> um, I would also add that um, that we are not alone in terms of uh, industries who uh, who oppose the imposition of spectrum fees. And I, I might just uh, you know throw on the table that perhaps we could just tax all uh, the unlicensed devices uh, to generate revenue for your innovation fund. Yeah, and, and actually, I wouldn't put that off the table. And, and, and in fact, I, although you know some of our allies, companies like Dell and, and so on, don't like to hear this, you know, if to the extent that there's some sort of determination to get to raise federal revenue off spectrum, it would be much more. It would be, you know, preferable. For example, on the TV white spaces, it would be preferable to have a very low device certification fee that generated ongoing federal revenue rather than to say we have to auction everything for what's a one-time bump. And especially in this market today, you know, with this looming, um, <laughs> the word looming is popular now, looming, looming AT&T T-Mobile merger, for example, um, there's a good chance that, uh, you know, that there's not going to be a huge uh, revenue from, uh, from spectrum auctions. And, and, you know, imagine if there was like a $3 or $5 fee on every um, unlicensed device. There's, there's, you know, hundreds of millions of them now um, operating, you know, in the Wi-Fi bands. And, and you know, so that, that, you know, I think that would be, believe it or not, not that I'm in favor of it, but it's a better alternative than auctioning everything and not having the balanced ecosystem. I, go ahead, John. It was, I, it was said half in jest, but I think the point is that uh, Matthew's initial question was, are there other ways uh, to, uh, um, to create a more efficient use of spectrum uh, other than auctions? And I, th I think the answer is that, yes, there's probably a number of other ways that the government could go about doing that, and they're just currently not exploring it, uh, save uh, Senator Snow and, and Senator Kerry's bill. I just wanted to go back a little bit to discussions about uh, government sharing of spectrum. Uh, you know, we've had some really positive successes in that front on expanding spectrum for unlicensed devices by coming up with creative ways that the unlicensed device manufacturers can demonstrate to the government that they've got a way to coexist on a non-interference basis. And the, the primary example I'm thinking of is uh, with regards to uh, 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi spectrum. We opened up an additional 254 megahertz of 5 gigahertz spectrum because industry came to us and said, hey, you know, I think uh, Michael was talking about some of this uh, opportunistic use of the spectrum, that the government has huge swaths of spectrum that in the time domain they're not using very often. You know, less than 99% of the time they may be using it, but that less than 99% of the time they really have to use it. Well, how can we figure out a way to uh, give uh, non-government users access to that spectrum? And the fact is that the government had a very strong incentive to actually try and work that out. They're, they're not void of incentives to want to figure out ways to share spectrum. And the primary incentive that's driving them now is their own spectrum constraints. Uh, the military in particular, as we move on to net-centric warfare and we also have to deal with, uh, you know, innovative threat vectors, whether it's radio-controlled uh, improvised explosive devices or those sorts of things, the government is finding itself, and particularly the military, that they need to sense their environment, they need to communicate in their environment, they need to communicate, you know, and over short distance, long distance, they need to communicate from Earth to space. They're doing all these things, this incredibly intense use of the radio spectrum 
And uh, so th they're looking for spectrum on their own. But the incentive they have in figuring out how to share with industry is because they learn more about how to share. They learn more how to have a sensing technology like a radar system coexist with the comms technology like Wi-Fi, and that's good for them. Uh, and in fact, they, they worked very, very hard, you know, hand in glove with the industry to solve some difficult technical challenges around figuring out a way to allow a Wi-Fi device exist in a band that is preserved for government radar systems. What the industry initially told us was that um, they've got smart technology and smart radios. They can sense their environment. And if they hear a radar system in the environment, they'll just hop off to a different frequency. So if the radar comes into their marketplace, they hop off and they go on to other, other channels. Uh, the problem was they couldn't really tell the difference between a radar system and their own uh, in-band inter-service interference. You've got a lot of Wi-Fi's together. They're sending out lots of packets of data. Those packets of data smack into each other and they put in spikes in the noise floor, in the, the, the radio floor, and they can't tell the difference between that and a radar system coming in. So the devices were shutting down all the time. So they said they wanted to, uh, that their in-band interference was random, but that radar systems have a very specific waveform. You get a little better view of the waveform, uh, they'd have a better able to differentiate between their own systems and the radar systems. Uh, telling this long story just by way to illustrate how strong the incentives are sometimes for the government to work through these things and to try and figure out ways to do this. Uh, telling them what the radar system looks like sounds like a very easy solution to their problem, but it also looks like you're telling somebody how to build a radar detector that somebody can put in the head of an anti-radar missile, which the Army would think would be a bad thing. Uh, but like I said, they rolled up their sleeves and they worked and they said, nah, we can show you enough that it's not a threat to us, but that you can put it into your equipment and you can fix the problem. I mean, we went through this for more than a year, and at the end of the day, we came up with a solution that the, uh, the military was comfortable, that their critical missions weren't being compromised, and an additional you know, 254 megahertz of unlicensed spectrum was made available. So I think a long way getting back to your initial question, uh, Matt, about you know, are there, is it just auctions, is that the only way to do things? I really do think you have to have a very flexible regulatory toolkit that based on different circumstances and different spectrum, you can have different solutions. So uh, the AWS spectrum where we simply told the government, if you can move somewhere else and clear up a bunch of this stuff, we will give you auction revenue to allow you to buy new equipment, new services, do new things. So that's a great solution. You get the government moving off. You get a clean greenfield piece of spectrum that's going to be uh, lots of people are going to want. That's a perfect kind of place to use an auction dynamic. Uh, you've got uh, a host of licensees who really just simply don't want to be in the business anymore, you know, and the government can collect that spectrum and, and put it into the marketplace. That's a great auction uh, example. But at the same time, if you can find opportunities where the government can share with uh, consumers either on a spectrum basis or on a network basis. Sometimes the government, if the government has spectrum that they're using for a particular service, you know, let's see, can you go out and buy that network capacity rather than building your own? Uh, that's another option that we should have. And like I said at the outset, you know, I think the most powerful option is to give as many licensees as much flexibility as possible to create their own incentives to innovate and invest and compete on, a, on an even playing field. Uh, and then I think we'll find that the capacity constraints are eased because more people are doing more things in more innovative ways. Yeah, no, great. Well, let's open it up for uh, any audience questions. Uh, do any of you have any? A uh, quick question for you all. The, the FCC has tried in the past many different auctioning systems. They tried initially, get everybody in a room, tell us how you're going to use the spectrum, and then we'll hand it out. They had the lottery system. And I think ultimately we did end up with this 
auction-based model. Uh, Mr. Calabresi, why, why do you think we should kind of take a half step back if we're not going to go all in with the financial system that we used for the last auction? Okay, so, so actually I wasn't saying there was anything wrong with the type of auctions that, you know, that we're having, and certainly auctions are better um, than, than, than lotteries, um, although we did get Senator Warner uh, thanks to that. Uh, he, he was one of the guys who r rolled up, uh, I guess organized a bunch of dentists to enter the lottery and got all kinds of licenses that they pieced together and sold to Craig McCaw and so on. But so there, so, so there was a lot of inefficient gamesmanship around beauty contests and lotteries. Uh, but um, so, so the auctions, you know, are very sophisticated uh, now and, and that's fine where, where they're appropriate. What I was saying is that you don't want to auction everything. And, and I think that's, you know, part of, part of John's point, too. I mean, imagine if, you know, what, what was previously considered the junk band um, at 2.4 gigahertz, where, um, you know, which was set aside for miscellaneous consumer devices like microwave ovens, baby monitors, cordless phones in your, in your home. Well, that's where Wi-Fi grew up because it could. So now you have this, you know, this huge... Uh, industry with tremendous consumer welfare that grew up on unlicensed spectrum because it wasn't auctioned. And so that's what I mean by a balanced ecosystem. Similarly, um, and, and somebody alluded to this before too, part of the National Broadband Plan, its goal of 500 megahertz, um, 270, and, th and this also shows how difficult it is to find greenfield spectrum we can auction on an exclusive basis, because the, the, the broadband plan uh, only identifies, it was only able to apparently to identify 270 megahertz that would be non-federal. And of that, 210 was, so about 75% is from two sources from broad, you know, their goal anyway, 120 from broadcasting, you know, which is tw 20 channels, that's quite, a, a quite ambitious. And then the rest, and then 90 from mobile satellite spectrum. Is, they're, they're the only two big sources. Mobile satellite spectrum, now really, they're not talking about auctioning. They may not auction any of it. Um, what, what, what they're doing is there's already mobile satellite systems. So what the commission did, and we think it was a good idea, for example, is up in, in the L band, um, they gave, uh, there's a company called Light Squared now where they're giving them the flexibility to, to use the spectrum for terrestrial uh, 4G you know, for, for, for LTE, for, for high capacity broadband that could compete with the current carriers um, on an open wholesale uh, basis. So that's a place where, and, and John mentioned this before, you can, you, you can sometimes just give, give increased flexibility um, to, in a sense, deregulate, you know, some of, some, some of the rules around the existing spectrum without even auctioning it and get a good result by putting conditions on. So the commission there put on a build-out condition. So Light Squared, in essence, isn't getting this free, this extra flexibility. They have to build out to 260 million pops population uh, by the end of 2015. They have to pay in Marset all kinds of money to reconfigure the band, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so I guess I'm just saying, once again, that we need more tools in the kit. And if everything's about auctions, we're going to get a bad uh, a policy result that's suboptimal. Yeah. Can I just yeah. follow on quickly on the on the on the spectrum flexibility piece? Because sure. I, th I think it's important to note. Uh, you mentioned the MSS folks uh, and the flexibility that they were uh, were given to develop a terrestrial component uh, to their networks. Now they're not the only uh, spectrum licensee out there who, over time, the FCC has deemed fit of uh, of granting spectrum flexibility. Um, you know, there was once a service called uh, ITFS and MDS, which was basically point-to-point -point microwave. They were granted additional flexibility to uh, to provide a, a wireless broadband type service, and uh, I think a majority of those holdings now are are, are a uh, a wireless service provider who 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 uh, who um, serve uh, according to their 10K. They have 140, 160 megahertz of, of spectrum in, in the uh, top 25 markets. Uh, currently, by the way, only serving about 4 million people, according to their, their uh, financials. 
So the point is, is that there have been other licensees in the past that have been granted flexibility. Um, the question, I think, is, is shouldn't that be a tool uh, for broadcasters as well going forward? I think that's, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, but to the point about taking a half step back, and I don't see this as uh, a subject of much of the current legislation that's moving around, but there has been a, a disturbing creep in that direction to dress up auctions with lots of conditions uh, to make them sort of quasi-administrative uh, hearings. You know, on the AWS3 spectrum, somebody comes in and says, you know, if you give me 10 megahertz for free, I'll provide a free service and I'll filter it so it doesn't have any adult content and then I'll have a second tiered service. And they said, well, we, we won't give that to you, but maybe we'll hold an auction and we'll make your business plan sort of a condition for those who want to bid in the auction. Uh, and you know, who's against free services and who's against some of these things? The problem is, is that you encourage, you know, this sort of beauty contest mentality where somebody else comes and says, no, no, wait, wait, I'll give you the free, I'll do the stuff for the kids, and you know, I'll donate some revenue to saving the whales. And somebody else goes, no, no, I got a better idea. And we lose the efficiency of getting this stuff out and letting the consumer be the ultimate arbiter of what is the best use of this spectrum. And I think that's the place that we need to get to. And the way to have the consumer be the ultimate arbiter is not for the government to be making arbitrary decisions saying this brand of licensee can only provide the following services using the following technology, and this licensee can do whatever it is they want. Uh, I think you'll find that consumers tend to like the whatever it is you want more than the government branded, you do this kind. So however we come out the other end of this current spectrum exercise, I think we need to make sure that there is a place, particularly for the broadcasters, that they get to engage in that kind of competitive, innovative dynamic that the rest of the, the industry has enjoyed. And because they've enjoyed that flexibility, they've come up with all these creative services that are, are generating an enormous amount of consumer demand. I think we'll have a, a much more pro-consumer pro -consumer public interest driven dynamic when everybody has the same opportunity to uh, invest and innovate and you know the, the, the customer, uh, the consumer, you know, picks winners and losers by their purchasing decisions. Mm. And we're out of time, so if you have any additional questions, feel free to approach uh, any of the panelists uh, down in the lobby for drinks. We appreciate your attendance. And I guess before we conclude, I guess to follow up to, you know, the question that was posed to Congressman Latta, you know, and I'll try to, you know, hone my uh, McLaughlin group, uh, like quick round, uh, but one being not a chance, 10 being, heck, it's, it's already law. Uh, what is the chance of uh, Congress patching, uh, you know, whether it's incentive auction authority or comprehensive spectrum policy reform uh, this year or even this Congress? So, Michael. <laughs> oh, boy. I wish, wish I knew, you know. Um, I would say, you know, 50-50 on incentive auction authority, but a, a much lower chance, unfortunately, about comprehensive uh, spectrum reform. Because it seems like unless you can put it on a bumper sticker, you know, deficit reduction or uh, 10th anniversary of 9-11, um, people aren't motivated enough where they don't understand what's at stake. And there's just, uh, that's why this, you know, this Internet caucus is so important because we need a whole lot more education just even among the staff and members of Congress. Yeah. Chris? And don't say 50-50. 50-50 <laughs> is a good answer. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess uh, our position would be that it's more likely than not to the extent that lawmakers acknowledge that con the broadcasters continue to provide a very valuable service to the public, whether it be public safety messaging in places like Joplin, Missouri, or, or, or Mississippi floods, whether it be multicast programming that serves a, a diverse and, and growing niche audience, whether it's the promise of mobile uh, digital television, which can can help uh, with the congestion issues that are being raised in Washington today. If Congress acknowledges that that's important to protect and we get the protections going forward uh, that will allow us to continue to innovate and provide the services that we promised to people during the DTV transition, then I'd say 50-50.
John? Uh, I think there are, you know, the, the, the public benefits that flow from getting this right are so manifest that something is clearly going to pass. Uh, having had experience in watching, uh, you know, comprehensive telecommunications legislation move through the Congress in the past, I'm not super optimistic. Uh, that something will happen this year. I think if something happens this year, it's going to be around uh, uh, budget issues. Mm -hmm. uh, although it doesn't sound like we're going to have a budget, so maybe that narrows things down <laughs> on that front as well. So uh, it'll happen. Uh, may not happen this year. Okay. All right, well, with that, thank you very much, and we'll see you downstairs in the lobby.